Well, this morning we want to continue in our look of Genesis chapter 1, the account that the Bible gives us concerning creation, concerning the heaven and the earth as we know it today. Now the text I wish to choose for our meditation this morning is found at the very end of chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 verse 31 would be the focus of the sermon this morning. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And seeking God's blessing, we want to spend our time in this text and context uh, this morning. And the title for the sermon is directly taken from the text before us, All Very Good. All Very Good. That was God's verdict upon his creation, upon his own handiwork. He looked upon everything. And in some sense we might say he looked back and we don't mean to be in any sense disrespectful, but he looked back, folded his arms and said, everything, all that I have brought into being, it's all very good. Well, we have been working our way through Genesis chapter 1. And the first thing we noticed in day 1, he created light. Day 2, the heavens and the firmament. Last week... We noticed under the sermon entitled, a, we a Work in Progress, we looked at from day three to day five. Day three, what happened? Dry land, earth, the seas, vegetable life. Day four, the sun, the moon, and the stars were brought into being. Day five, fish and fowl were taken from the water, created from the water. Animal life from the water. And here we now come to the end of creation. We come to day six in uh, the creation account. And what do we have first of all? Well, we have land animals from the earth. Verse 24, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. Cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. God created all the animals after their kind. One kind didn't change into another kind. There's no evolution here whatsoever. God created them according to one particular kind, and he created another according to another particular kind. That's the way he has done it, and that's what we find today in the world that we live in. And that was the first thing that he did on day six, the last day of creation, created these animals in order that the world might be populated. But of course, today we really want to look at the pinnacle of God's creation. And it is a pinnacle because mankind is made in the image of God. This is what we find here in verse 26. There's a slight change here. God said, let us make man. He never said that about anything else that he made before. He never said, let us make the animals, or let us make the fowl of the air, or the fish of the sea. No, but here, friends, there is a change. We are to notice this. We are to look at our Bibles, and we are to grasp and assimilate all the words that have been given to us because they convey information to us that is special and should be, we should take notice of. Let us make man in our image. Man came from the earth, just like the animals. They're not the same flesh, of course, but they came from the same source. Man is absolutely unique. He is made in the image of God. He has been created by the triune God, a special act of creation by the Father, by the Son, and by the Holy Spirit. 
and mankind have been created in the image of God. God does not, of course, have a body. God is a spirit. Yes, we know that when the Son of God came down to this world, he took upon himself a body, a true body and a reasonable soul, as our catechism would teach us. But here, at the beginning of time, when God said, let us make man in our image, that image is knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. And therefore, in some real sense, when Adam and Eve were created at the beginning, they resembled their creator. And does this not then put us far and away and above everything else in creation? We are inclined, friends, to be too proud of ourselves. Because of sin, we are wrapped up in ourselves, and we like to feed our own egos. But there is something that we should be proud of. We should be proud of the fact that God, in his infinite grace and mercy, has decreed that he would create man in his image. And therefore, all of us, even as we shall see as we go through this book, even in our fallen state, we are to resemble something of the triune God. Yes, we know we have a fallen nature. We received that from Adam. Yes, we know that. And we know that the image has been marred. It has been scarred. It is not what it once was. No one's going to deny it. But nevertheless, there is still some resemblance. And friends, we are to think upon that. We are to realize that, in some sense, we are to reflect our Maker. We are to reflect our Maker in our speech, in our conversation, and how we live and how we operate in this world. And people are to see something different about the people of God. About the people who take the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The second Adam, whom we shall be like one day. Is that not a glorious thought? Is this not a great incentive towards us that we might do whatever we can to, to be sanctified? That we might be reminded of that awesome verse that we find in the book of Hebrews? Without holiness no man shall see the Lord. We might have Bibles, we might have libraries full of books, we might be able to, to quote the Reformers and the Covenanters, we might be able to speak well of the evangelistic outreach that took place at the, with uh, Whitfield and Wesley, we might be able to speak about these things with great authority. But what's our lives saying? Here we're told we're made in the image of God. And therefore, we are to delight in that. And we are to seek to praise and glorify our Redeemer and our Creator. And he says here, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. We are to have dominion. It doesn't mean to say we are to abuse the animals, the fish, the environment. Of course not. As your minister has said on other occasions, as far as the environment is concerned, we are to be model environmentalists. Why is this? Well, we recognize that this world is not our world. This world belongs unto our great God. And he has given man dominion over this world, over this environment over what God has created in order that he might use and co 
cultivate what is there for man's good and ultimately for the glory of God. Now, as we look at creation and as we see the things that this chapter brings up, we see how contemporary the Bible is. Is it not a common comment that we get from many people today? Well, the Bible's an old book. Well, we have to agree it is an old book. And then they'll go on and say, well, it's, it's outdated. It was okay for generations ago for these people, but it has nothing to say to us today in the 21st century and in our modern environment. It's a relic of the past, they might say. Well, we totally disagree, of course, because it is the Word of God. And the more we look at it, the more we realize that it speaks to our contemporary world. Is it not common among some people today to tell us that animal life is just as important as human life? Do we not have many who can be quite active in animal rights movements? And they will try to tell us that animal life is just as important as human life. Now, we acknowledge that all life is important. God is the one who has given all life. But animal life, or insect life, or fish life, or bird life, is not as important as human life. Here, it's clear. We are to have dominion over these things, over these lives. We are to exercise dominion over them. And this would tell us that the life of humans is far and away above the life of any animal. And we are to use them for good, for good purposes. And of course we are to be ones who care for our animals. A true Christian will look after whatever animals they have around them, whether they be pets or whether they be in a farming situation. The true Christian will be concerned and will seek to look after the animals under their jurisdiction. Now it seems here at the beginning that man was to eat fruit and vegetables and uh, the animals likewise were to eat what are we told here? Every herb bearing seed. That was the case uh, way back in the beginning. We know, of course, as we shall come to it, things changed because of sin. But initially, this was to be mankind's food. It doesn't mean to say that that has to be the way today. We'll come to that when we come to it. But at the beginning, that's the way it was. That's what God had provided for mankind. And God's verdict in all of this was it was very good, as our text will tell us. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Well, surely there are one or two lessons that we can draw, therefore, from these verses and from our text this morning. Surely the first thing, friends, we are to notice that because we're made in the image of God and because we have all this responsibility that we are to have dominion over the creation, over the creatures and over the creation, surely this reminds us that we are accountable unto God. He's the one who made us. He's the one who formed us. He knew us before we were formed in the womb. He has brought us forth from the womb. He has given us life. He has poured out blessings upon us day after day after day. We might not acknowledge them. We might live as if God doesn't exist. But that cannot be the way. 
we must recognize that we are accountable unto God. And one day we will stand before him and we will give an account where everything will be laid bare, where we will not be able to hide anything. The motives, the intentions of our hearts shall be laid bare. Now, of course, this teaching is repugnant to many today, and it's particularly repugnant to those who believe in evolution. What does evolution teach, we might ask ourselves? Well, it can be a very complicated subject, and sometimes the evolutionist will use big words to give the impression of learning and wisdom. And he will seek to bamboozle the ordinary private Christian. And maybe you've encountered this yourself. The subject of the existence of God, for instance, or the biblical account of creation may be a topic that you have uh, somewhat discussed with, a, with an atheist or maybe with someone who believes in evolution. And very often, if they've got any kind of knowledge about evolution, they will try to use words that the ordinary person maybe doesn't understand. And they will seek to impress people or seek to impress people with their so-called wisdom and, and they will seek to bamboozle people. With due respect to anyone who believes in evolution, simply stated, friends, evolution is silliness. It is unscientific science fiction. And they'll use arguments or seek to use arguments like science has disproved the existence of God. Maybe that's something that you've come across as a private Christian. Someone has said to you, well, you know science has disproved the existence of God. And by implication, therefore, that the Genesis account of creation cannot be right. Because if science has disproved the existence of God, therefore, the creation account is utter nonsense. Well, how are you going to respond what were you going to say if someone says to you, well, science has disproved the existence of God? Well, it's a quite a simple answer, friends, because it is nonsense. Because science, as a body, is divided over the existence of God. And what's more, science cannot prove or disprove the existence of God. It is impossible for science to do it, or any science to do this. They do not have the capabilities to prove or disprove the existence of God. And here, friends, as a gospel minister, as I stand before you here today, I'm in exactly the same position. I do not for one moment tell you that I can prove the existence of God or that I can disprove the existence of God. The Bible does not take that position. The Bible opens up in the first verse, in the beginning, God. <coughs> Why does it say that? Because the Bible knows that every single human being knows in his own heart that the God of the Bible exists. And the Bible does not seek to prove what you already know, but what the atheist and what the evolutionist would try to deny. So, Science is divided. There will be scientists who are Christians who believe in the existence of 
the God of the Bible, and they believe in the biblical account of creation. But on the other hand, there will be other scientists who don't believe in the existence of God, and they don't believe in the biblical account of creation. And yet, there'll be other scientists who don't believe in the existence of God, and who don't believe in the theory of evolution. And therefore, when people say to you that science has disproved the existence of God, quite frankly, you can say with authority that they are talking nonsense. Science is divided over this matter. Now, what do we know about evolution? Well, basically, evolution tells us that everything came from nothing. Think on it, friends. There's not much words there. Everything came from nothing. We don't believe that at all. We believe everything came from God. That's what we believe. Someone wrote concerning the, the evolutionist and what the evolutionist believes and what the evolutionist would have us to believe. Here's what the evolutionist believes. Quote, Nothing produced everything. Non-life produced life. Randomness produced precision. Chaos produced order. That's what they believe. Nothing produced everything. Now when we say that God in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth out of nothing. Nothing's not a commodity. It's not as if nothing was in the corner and from nothing God brought everything. Nothing is nothing. It's not a commodity. It's not an entity. It is nothing. And nothing can come from nothing. But they say nothing produced everything. It's a scientific fact. Yes, it is a scientific fact that we totally agree with. That non-life cannot produce life. You cannot get life from non-life. Well, the evolutionist believes you can. The evolutionist believes in natural selection, randomness produces precision. This world, friends, this universe is a marvel, an absolute marvel. Here we are on our earth, a wonderful and glorious planet, and everything is interconnected. The ecosystem, everything is connected. There's a great plan and design and purpose in the earth. What is it? We revolve around the sun, I do believe. Well, if we were a bit closer to it, we would burn. If we were a bit further away, we would freeze. Where does this precisionness come from? Where does it come from? Is it from randomness? Have you ever been in a car crash? I hope you haven't, but no doubt, maybe you have, or you've seen it. What happens? Does it produce precision? Nonsense. There's nothing randomness about this world. It's under the providential care of a triune God. Even today, moment by moment, that's the God of the Bible. Did chaos ever produce order? Never. You've never seen it. Never. You never will. It never does. But God. What are we told in the beginning? The earth was 
without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Out of chaos he brought order and beauty, purpose, design. The great architect, the great God of heaven moved and worked. Not randomless, purposeless evolution. Is it any wonder, friends, that we hear so much about mental illness? Now, I'm not going to go off on a tangent about something that I really know nothing about. But is it any surprise to you that we're awash with mental illness, especially among young people? When they're taught, when they go to the schools, there is no God. We've come from nothing, we're going to nothing. There's no purpose, there's no plan in this world. There's no hope. That's what we're being taught. That's what dominates society today. Is it any wonder, friends, we have so many people who are being propped up with drugs? When you take the purpose of life out of life, Let's be clear. Evolution is dominating our society. It's in our schools. It's even in our churches. It's in our health system, our justice system, our governments, our universities, our colleges. You'll find it there, all over. This is what the mindset of the modern man is set upon. We've come from apes. There is no God. Then there's nothing to worry about. We don't need to be accountable. It has a negative effect upon our society. And friends, we need to get back to the biblical account. And we conclude that there, there are things in the biblical account that... We don't know all the details. We're not going to say for one moment that we know all the details. But we know sufficient to realize that we are accountable unto God. And evolution certainly has an influence upon our society. Is there not a, is there not a, a continual drive to practice abortion? Is there not moves afoot to lessen the legal requirements? Am I right in saying that some would want to have abortion up until birth? Well, what does the evolutionist teach us? That the unborn are simply a cluster of cells. It doesn't matter. They're just cells. And we can see it in the other end of the spectrum. Do we not have a, a bill being presented before Westminster and another one likely to be presented in our Holyrood Parliament basically to encourage people to end their lives if they're terminally ill or if they're elderly and maybe they're a drain upon their families? Or maybe they're a drain upon society. Will there not be some kind of bill brought forward? What is it? Assisted dying bill? Assisted suicide? Or maybe it should be more a called assisted murder? What drives these things? It is evolution. It's the thinking of evolution. We've come from nothing. We're going to nothing. We have lost the fact that we are made in the image of God and it is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. If people realized that when they seek the, to die, when they seek to end their lives, that they're rushing into the presence of eternal God. Let's be clear, evolution is having a very detriment detrimental effect upon our society. In Proverbs chapter 8 verse 36 it ends with these words 
All they that hate me love death. All they that hate me love death. Is this not what's dominating society? The unborn, the elderly, the terminally ill, kill them. All they that love me, all they that hate me, love death. Creation matters today. The creation account matters. It teaches us the importance. And as I said earlier, it does have an effect and it has got something to say to our society. What is another issue that we find dominant in our society today? Is it not transgenderism? Now, I recognize at least I hope I'm true here, and when I say this, I recognize that all before me will agree with exactly what I'm about to say. But society is not with us as far as this is concerned. Have we not been told here in the Genesis account, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them, verse 27. Is that not crystal clear? There's no debate over this as far as we're concerned. There are two genders, male and female, both made in the image of God. There are no other genders. If you said that, friends, in the street today, or in some public place, you will be taken aside. You may well be charged. You may well face up a uh, police inquiry because of that. Well, friends, the day might come when we will have to stand up for the Word of God. There is no third or fourth or fifth or whatever number of genders. Females have... XX chromosomes and males have XY chromosomes. And no matter what we might do to our bodies, whether by chemicals or whether by surgery, we cannot change our biological sex. It's impossible. And furthermore, friends, there is no such person as a trans person. Again, if you said that outside, Terrible things might happen to you. But a trans person is someone who is deluded. A trans woman, for instance, is a man who thinks he is a woman. You cannot change. It's impossible. You don't determine your gender. God determines your gender. And you have to live according to it. And if you have a problem with it, then the problem is in your mind. You are rebelling against what God has done. And here, do we not find then that the Word of God is bang up to date? It speaks to our contemporary society. Oh, we, may, we might not want to heed it, but nevertheless it tells us these things for our edification. That we might know. Well, it speaks to our creation. It speaks to our society, I should say. And therefore, because creation speaks so much to us, friends, we should study creation. We should study it. We should see that God speaks to us in creation. That's why we sang Psalm 111. Verse 2, for instance, the prose version says, The works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. The works of the Lord are great. God's work of redemption is great. It's far above the work of creation and providence. Yes, that's true. But the work of creation is great also. And it also reveals to us Things concerning our great God that would cause us to worship and to adore Him. 
verse 4, the, the metrical version of Psalm 111, verse 4, His works most wonderful He hath made to be thought upon. Yes, we do delight in what the Lord Jesus Christ has done in the cross, and we thank Him for it, and we'll remember the Lord's death in the coming days, God willing. But we look at creation, and there's so much to learn. Indeed, everything that God does is there for our learning. It's there for our edification. It's there to increase our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we look at it, what variety, what power. It's all there in creation. And what care and compassion God has for creation. Well, friends, if he has care and compassion for his creation, what about his creatures? He looks after all his animals. They're all his. And does, it, does this not remind us and teach us then that God has a great love for his people? If he delights in his creation, if he's able to say it was all very good, what does he say about his people? What does he say about those who have been saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are they not precious? If creation is precious, if it shows his power, if, if we see a great variety of the works of God in creation, oh friends, do we not see that in some sense, what he's done for the people of God? <coughs> and surely... As we look at creation, we are to see that he is greater than creation. Many of the environmentalists, what? They look at the creature and they worship the, the creature. We are friends who will look at creation and we will marvel at it. But our worship will be directed to the great creator and all that he has done. Creation, therefore, is that we might see that God is far away above all his creation. The Bible talks about this, the great God who created all things. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27, to conclude, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Here was, here was King Solomon at the dedication of the temple. Behold, the heaven and the heavens of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I have built it. It was a magnificent building. But what is it in comparison with God himself? The creation, the universe, the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, everything. What is it in comparison to God himself? Nothing. Therefore, let us worship God, the one who said that all he made was all very good. Amen. May God bless his word to us. Let us pray together.